Good. Uh, again, one more time. My apologies for the delays and uh, my mess up with the timing. Uh, I'm glad we're back. Uh, I'm glad to be with you, even in these ridiculous ways that we have these days. Uh, uh, but at least when we're doing the Zoom video, we don't have to wear masks. Uh, I hope you're all good. Uh, I had, a, I can share with you just for a second, uh, my experience that happened to me in the last uh, three, four weeks. I went through COVID. Uh, it's not fun, it's not pleasant, it's tough, and it's uh, something that, 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 that I wish nobody has to go through. Uh, I was in a, in a, uh, with a mild uh, stage of COVID with a, uh, without the, the, the oxygen therapy, without any of that, but I can tell you it wears you down. It's like nothing that I've ever had before. Uh, I'm glad I'm, I'm true with it, but my message is really stay safe. Try to do whatever you can not to get it until vaccine comes one day, whenever it comes and whatever comes with it. Put that on the side. Uh, with the message stay safe and healthy, we go to uh, the, the, the reason why I'm here tonight. And that is just to, to share with you a little bit of uh, my experience and how I see uh, modern implant dentistry and uh, the way we were learning how to do it. And I wish to thank you one more uh, also for the introduction and in the introduction of uh, my short CV, you, understand, uh, you could hear that I spent a lot of time at the universities, a lot of time in the research and also I was lucky enough to spend uh, a, 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 Eight, eight, nine years as a uh, clinical expert for Nobel uh, while keeping my private practice. Uh, what that experience gave me is spending time with the researchers, with the scientists, and also with the mechanical engineers to understand a little bit, uh, pick up some of their brain to get the knowledge of uh, what the implant is, how it works, what did it does from the other point of view as well, not just from the point, pure point of clinical dentistry. And uh, that's how we also came to the subject that we're gonna talk about tonight, uh, how to integrate all of that knowledge into the daily practice and manage patients' expect expectations. Uh, I will, throughout the presentation, mostly focus on uh, uh, let me see why this is not running. I will focus on uh, the, the, the aesthetic region on immediate implant placement, but I'm going to try to also guide you uh, with that that uh, treatment with the, that that kind of a therapy to the uh, research that is behind it and what guides us in every step of the treatment. This is a little short movie about Belgrade, the city where I'm from, the city where I live, and uh, it's nice parts about the uh, city that is vibrant as the music that is going on behind it. Uh, the city that actually was uh, within the part of the Ottoman Empire for three, four hundred years, and you can see and hear and feel a lot of Turkish influence here as well. And you see some famous people. I wear. I have the same name as the greatest scientist that is coming from this part. We are stubborn people, like this right here that is most famous. There's a couple of people that are well known in Turkey as well, like Obradovic, Bogdanovic, uh, and Raj that come from this part of the world. Now, let's go further and see what why we are here. Successful implant, uh, implant restoration. They are a uh, big part of uh, what we're doing, well, the, the, the harmony between the, the dentition, between the restoration, everything has to come into a place. Quite often I say, 
what is the most difficult thing for me to restore when I'm having a patient? It is actually a single tooth because what we have to mimic is the na what nature gave us. So the surrounding of one implant, of single implant restoration, is what nature gave us. And this is what we're dealing with when we're dealing with these patients. So we have to look at every detail. And then looking at it, we quite often come to sort of a con uh, confusions and controversies how should I approach it? Should I do an implant immediately or delayed or single stage, two stages? Should I use bone grafting materials or not? Uh, or the, what should I use from these materials? How really to approach it? But uh, all of these questions, at least some of them will try to answer tonight through during this presentation. And I will share with you also our experience. Sometimes we got lucky, uh, not knowing what we're doing, but still trying to figure it out. Uh, like in this case, for example, here, uh, an implant that was placed in 2003, an immediate implant was actually quite a wide implant. It was 5.0 implant, it was something that I would never do these days, but still uh, uh, over the long period of time it was a successful result and this was 10 years follow-up. Sometimes we didn't and in these situations we were not really going in the right way because our implant position was not correct, our dimension of the implant was not correct, but we were constantly under pressure from these kind of things and you know you have these trends, you have the social awareness, uh, all of us uh, are facing the patients that are coming with the magazines and uh, whatever photos of the famous people and they tell us, hey, I want to look like that. Usually my answer is yes, I want to run 100 meters under 10 seconds, but it's not going to happen. I have uh, about 20 kilos more, 20 years more and or 30 years more, and I cannot run that fast and simply will not happen. So we have to manage these expectations. We have to talk to our patients and get them to understand also what is it what we can do for them. Uh, we're facing with these kind of uh, television shows as well. And uh, this is from something that was called Swan, I think, in the United States. And from that comes this. And again, it's another thing that we have to face. It's another thing that we are have to explain our patients, you know, they also look in Instagram and it's not just these TV shows, it's our colleagues as well that show things on uh, the social networks and they say, oh, this is what I did. This is, uh, I just finished this. You never see follow up. You never see what it looks like later. And at that moment looks perfect. Hmm. A couple of years later, they're in my office and I have to fix it. So these things are what we are facing and we have to manage these expectations. So looking at this young lady, she came to our office and if I tell her, you're gonna go out like this and then eventually we're gonna do something on your teeth. Of course, she's just gonna look for the guy next door. So yes, we cannot do everything like in these TV shows, but we can do a lot if we know what we're doing, if we are careful what we're doing, if we follow certain guidelines, if we follow certain evidence and then work by it, uh, follow that and uh, work in these steps, we can achieve success and she's not gonna go off like this. We're gonna see later how she's gonna go off. Uh, let's see a little bit of a history as well. And when I say let's look at a little bit of history, I mean let's look at what we see from the history. Uh, try just to kill the something on my screen for a second. Oh. Immediate implants, they're not something that we invented just recently. If you look at this, uh, this is the, 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 the example, this is uh, an example from Smithsonian Museum. This is from my time and it's about five, 600 years uh, old sample. 
even these days, people tried to uh, get their, somehow get their teeth. And if you look at these incisors, they're actually pieces of shell that are knocked into the patient's jaw. At that time, they didn't have anesthesia. So uh, uh, assuming that they're really willing to uh, have their teeth immediately restored because these shells were knocked into the bone without anesthesia, it must have hurt like hell. But still, you see that even at that time, there was a desire and kind of a solution for the patients for the immediate restorations. Now, going through the time of the implant dentistry, uh, we go through a certain discoveries or certain uh, uh, periods of time as what was done at certain decades and then in 60s. We have the discovery of the biocompatibility of uh, titanium by Professor Brenmark. And then the 1965, the first patient. We're gonna see how it, that developed later on in a couple of slides. And go to 70s, that's the description of also integration in 1978 uh, by Professor Brenmark, and then comes to run to conference where the also integration is confirmed and everybody acknowledged that implants work. Uh, the Professor Albertson gave the, uh, the def definition of the clinical criteria of success in the paper that is published in 1986. And uh, if you were a part of uh, a DAD meeting where for at the, the, the satellite symposium by the uh, EOT, uh, it was organized by EOT, Professor Albertson and I gave a little bit of uh, that, that uh, sort of history or, uh, uh, outlook, overlook, and the, uh, also the, 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 the a new uh, way of looking of also integration and also MUCO integration, uh, or the, the, the new approach of looking at the soft tissue integration and how knowing and understanding how soft tissue are is very important. Uh, in the 90s, the uh, OSA integration was proven uh, with the high survival rates and high success rates, if you will. And then also the new techniques developed like guided bone regeneration. It wasn't anymore just place the implant where yet, uh, wherever the bone is, but actually build the bone and place the implant in the right place where you need it for a tooth because none of our patients come for implant. They actually come for teeth. This is what they see and this is what they want. Uh, the end of the millennium comes with rough implants, comes with the uh, technological advancement where we see that with the, the different types of the surfaces, we have better also integration, faster also integration, and we're jumping the, the bone distance by the, uh, and by that having the faster also integration. Now comes the zeros, the 2000s, the new uh, advancements in the treatments like uh, Novum, we uh, like column four in 2000s. So we are rehabilitating patients in totally different ways. Uh, knowing better biomechanics, knowing the uh, understanding the biomechanics and knowing how to uh, use the, uh, the, that, that, that research into putting it in the clinical use. Well, we have the use of cone beams and with that development of the digital protocols with guided surgery. And at teens, we are understanding now, learning the three-dimensional biology. We go fully into digital protocols. Uh, the technology gives us, uh, with a, together with intraoral scanning, gives us smart fusion. We have 3D printing. All of those techniques are now used in three, uh, treating, treating our patients. So all of the uh, research that was done, from the biology point, from the biomechanics, from the use of digital technologies, all of that is something that we are using today to treat the patients. But looking through these 50, 60 years, you can understand it didn't happen overnight. Like nothing really happens overnight. It took a long time of research and development to get to this point.
And if you look at this spiral that was developed some years ago by Nobel Biocare, and I really like to use them in, my, our present, in my, our, my presentation, you can see how technology was developed over time and starting from uh, the early implants from Brennemark and then going further uh, development of a Procera, of a digital technology, use of different materials like, uh, like zirconia over time for the restoration, then eventually for the implants. All of that uh, improved the way we treat patients. And this is where we started. These are actually the first prototypes of implant used by Brennemark. Uh, when they figured out that the screw type design is something that is going to work, uh, they used all of these in the dog studies. And you can see these are the original actually slides from uh, uh, these, these animal research, uh, trying to, to, to uh, see how different screw designs as well will be used, will uh, work in, in these animal experiments. And you see these titanium blocks that were used at a time, titanium discs, to prove the actual binding of a bone to the titanium surface. And you see the uh, bone collected from, from, from these. And these are the dogs that work out. These are the uh, images of the dogs used in these studies. And you can see the initial uh, implants being placed in the dog, Jones, uh, dog uh, bones, dog joes and then eventually extracted and you see, uh, I mean, animals were sacrificed and then these were used for the histological samples. And actually the initial hex that was used at a time on a Brandmark implants was not necessarily invented for the, uh, for the connection with the abutment itself, but the, the hex at that time was used as a, the, something as a device, how you're gonna place the implant, so for the implant driver. And then they figured out that, you see that some things actually happen by accident, but then research shows that it's good. This was used uh, for the, uh, as a tool to be able to place the implant for the implant driver to put on. And here you see the, the rest of the, uh, then uh, the images for these animal studies and then implants placed in the uh, dog jaw, uh, jaw bones and then uh, even restoration, uh, uh, these, these sort of uh, metal restorations that we use to see that this works. The very first implant motor, the implants that were actually not delivered sterile, they were delivered in these uh, initially, uh, even without these glass vials, and then uh, you would sterilize them like you would buy a screw in a, in, a, in a department store, in the hardware store, actually. And uh, this is how this is from that, from what we started, we are now going into something completely, completely different. And I will let you, you can hear the, 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 the sound from the video, right? Good. Today I would like you to meet the first patient that was subjected to the reconstruction procedure of tissue integrated prosthesis based on osseointegration. integration. In 1965, this patient had a serious problem. He had a cleft pellet that had not been reconstructed uh, with closure of the gap, so that he had to wear an upper jaw prosthesis, including an obturator. When he unfortunately lost the teeth in the lower jaw, he had serious difficulties in functioning intraorally with the uh, movable denture in the lower jaw. As a consequence of our work at that time on cleft pellets, grafting tissues, and uh, on, as a consequence of our studies on hemorrheology using skin tube chambers, both of those studies being performed at the Department of Plastic Surgery at Sargas Hospital in Gothenburg, we decided to try in this particular case to provide him with a tissue integrated prosthesis in the lower jaw. So, in 1965, 
four titanium fixtures were installed in his edentulous lower jaw. And since then, he has been wearing the same fixed bridge construction, which I'm going to show you now. The consensus at that time in the 1960s was that it was impossible to penetrate the skin and mucous membranes for any prolonged period of time, mostly because of the risk for inflammation. The non-biological material would ultimately be rejected. Today, the oral application is well tested scientifically and has become a routine method all around the world, giving thousands of patients the possibility to live a normal life in spite of their edentulism. So that patient that was treated in 1965 uh, actually died with uh, that implant in the, not that implant, those four implants in his mouth and that reconstruction. Uh, this uh, that that is about 40 years later uh, after the, this implant was placed uh, that uh, this this picture was taken, and uh, yes, it looked aesthetically let's say I'm pleasing, but if all of my patients have a function 40, 50 years later, I'm happy. I'm really happy. And I don't know if you know this gentleman, but uh, funny story, that's a taxi driver that was driving the first patient to the implant surgery. So he was the second patient because he heard from this guy, asked him, where is he going? He said, I'm going to have implants placed. Hmm, interesting. Well, maybe I can go there. And this is him 44 years later. Uh, the proof that implants work is, oh, this is all the only thing you need to show that implants do work. Now, if we look at, as, as I said, I will focus on immediate protocols throughout the presentation as we go through the research of it as well. Uh, looking at, what we started with, with Professor Brennemark uh, in 1965, having the implants at work and the protocol that says six months, you place the, you please place the implant, you wait six months, and after six months, you go for the uh, restoration of the submerged healing. But already in 1976, uh, the literature shows first article about the implants, immediate implant being placed uh, in a patient. Now, as we go on, it really didn't kick in until 19, uh, 2000s when we got a moderately rough surfaces. And now let's spend a little bit of time talking about implants. I'm going to try to go a little bit faster with these slides, uh, but to give you a little bit of understanding of what I learned as well, how when implants are developed, when you look at the whole picture, what details do you look at? And then we look at the implant characteristics. We have the macro and the micro and macro design. In a macro design, you actually look at the threads and this and that, but then you look at the implant material as well. And this is important as well. Not every titanium is the same. When you, what you want to have from the implants that you're working with is the purest possible uh, titanium the co and the one that you actually uh, want to work with is the commercially pure titanium of the grade four. The, uh, let's say, less premium brands, let's, let's just call it that way, uh, are the, uh, trying to make, by the way, the grade four titanium is not really strong material. Uh, it can easily bend, it can easily break. So for that reason, many, many companies are actually using alloy materials, add different types of uh, materials like alumina to make the titanium stronger. By doing that, you lose a biocompatibility of a material. Uh, for example, Noble Biocare is doing something that's called cold work titanium. It presses the titanium in this uh, dye, the rod of titanium in a dye, and by pulling it, makes the titanium stronger. It changes 
the, 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 the strength of a material without changing the physical capabilities of the material. And you can see in this table here how, uh, how by, by, by these tests of the yield strength, what is the, uh, the pressure the material actually can withstand by uh, changing it from the grade four into a uh, cold work noble biocare type of uh, titanium. And then on top of it, you have the tyanite surface. I'm not gonna go into real details, but just to give you an idea of what the tyanite is, it's the uh, actually added surface. Like when you make the, the roughness of a titanium, you can either do it by removing part of the surface, like with blasting and acid etching, or doing the, the electrochemical procedure like the uh, ionization, where you are increasing the thickness of the titanium. By doing that, you are in, uh, also enriching this surface with the crystalline and the phosphate. Uh, and, the phosphate. But, uh, and this is something that is very, very useful during the also integration process. The more phosphates you have, actually, the uh, better the bone responses to the, uh, during the osseointegration. integration. And you can see through these histological examples how bone healing is after the three weeks with the uh, use of a uh, tyanite surface compared on your left to the machine surface. Uh, and also during these studies, uh, it was noted that you have much, much faster osseointegration integration when you look at the bone to implant contact. These are the rabbit femurs that uh, we looked at the machine and tyanite surface in a period of one, three, and six weeks. And you see that you have way more bone to implant contact. Is that important for us clinically? Well, Glauser and his uh, co workers did a study where they actually measured the stability of an implant compared machine than the tyanide surface. And these were immediately loaded implants in the posterior maxilla. And you can see by with the ISQ measurements that you don't see that drop in the uh, initial stability when you use tyanide implants compared to the machine implants. Uh, and also in 2005, another thing has uh, happened and that's added groove into the implants. Now one can say, Hmm, okay, groove, yeah, maybe, maybe it does something, maybe it doesn't. But then when you look at the, all of the research that was done, it's not just a groove, it is actually the groove that has 110 microns. Why does it matter? Well, it was compared different sizes of grooves, and then to see that exactly this one gives you the right uh, depth, the right width, that it's going to actually increase bone to implant contact. It was compared with 80 micros and 100. It was smaller and bigger. And it actually, right, this one works and has uh, more bone to implant contact compared to the other ones, as you can see from the, uh, from the table and uh, from the research that was done at that time, that you actually increase 26.6% of uh, bone to implant contact. And on these, uh, of this electron microscopy, you can see also uh, the, the also conduction much higher with the grooves compared to the uh, non-grooved implant. And here it's nicely subtracted that you can see how coagulum actually forms within these grooves uh, on the, uh, that, are, that are made on the threads of the implants. And these are the first two tyanide implants that were placed in 2000 and then uh, followed up by Dr. Owen Glauser in 2011. And you can see that the remarkable bone levels uh, and wonderful result on the follow-up of 11 years later. Now you saw that a lot of, of these studies actually compared uh, tyanide with machined. And why is that? And Jim von Albertson actually published a, doc, uh, a paper, an interesting paper, and shows that 75% of the public documented implants are actually still machined implants. Out of uh, other implants, 
and you can see all of those that are there. Uh, the second most documented implant is actually uh, the, the, on your screens. You don't see the the, the cameras on the side. What do we don't see? Uh, your 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 screens because with me the the screens of the other people are the covering the part of the screen you don't see that you no, see no, no. no we don't see good we, good, good good just just be sure. all of your some, slide. some of the letters that i know what is on the slide but some of it is covered here uh good so you see that from uh, all of the other implants the thionide implants are actually the most documented uh, so the most documented rough surface implants are thionide implants and you can see through documentation that there's plenty of uh, 10, 11, 12 year studies that show very, very good results with uh, thionide. And now we go into the intro short introduction of the new surface as well. Let's call it a new surface, it's not necessarily that new. But as the time develops and as we understand what is actually important in treatment of patients, and we understand that some of the aspects are changing. This is what I, uh, when I did that in history introduction, understanding the 3D biology, uh, we understand how important the soft tissues are and the integration of the soft tissue. So we have the new breakthrough of the surfaces the Thai Ultra and the Xeal. And I'm not gonna go too much into the, this, just a short introduction, and then we go further. So the Xeal is the, on the level of the soft tissues, and the Thai Ultra is on the level of the implants. Even though I said the Xeal is for, uh, on the level of the soft tissue, you will see that the part that you saw that the part of the implants has Xeal as well. Uh, uh, and, and Still, this is a sort of a uh, rough surface. It's not really smooth. It is, uh, it is a, it's a surface with a certain amount of rough, roughness. It is designed to promote the soft tissue attachment through its chemist, chemistry and topography. Uh, and it went basically through the same procedure as the Thionite or the Thai Ultra in this case. It's the anodization procedure. It's just that a current is higher on the rougher and the, it is slightly lower in the less rougher. And just uh, for, the, for the ones that don't necessarily know how the, this anodization process goes, you have uh, a certain uh, solution where you dip in the implant and then you implant, you connect to one electrode and then there is another one. And as the current goes in, the anodization process goes. So for the soft tissue, this is very sophisticated technique because you have different levels, different uh, amounts of roughness on the implant itself. So it goes from very rough at the apex to a less rougher towards the uh, coronal positive part of the implant. And then the very neck of the implant is uh, with a, a very uh, minor, uh, with a minimal roughness, and so are the abutments as well. And this, this amount of roughness uh, is measured to be pretty much ideal for the uh, uh, attachment of the soft tissues. And this is, again, proven through research. The xeal surface uh, has much faster growth of the human gingival epithelial cells in these in vitro studies compared again to the machine surface. And machine surface, or even polished, if you were uh, for some of the abutments, uh, is something that we normally use for uh, in our daily restoration with our abutments that we use. So then clinically, this was actually shown as well in two year controlled study that we have higher levels of the keratinized mucosa, which is for me very, very appealing because I know how important the soft tissues are, especially good thick keratinized mucosa in long term uh, success. 
And this is the Thai Ultra. As I mentioned before, it is uh, the, 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 the uh, surface that goes into a certain gradient. So from the uh, most, most uh, uh, porous on the apex towards the less porous of the coronal part. And the surface is also a very, very hydrophilic. And you'll see this as the implant is dipped in the uh, blood-like solution here, uh, how, the, 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 how the hydrophilicity works in this case. The implant is not dipped in any solution before or water or whatever. It is actually coated by a very uh, interesting protective layer that the, when the, uh, it comes in the contact with the liquid, th that same moment this protective layer dissolves and then you have a pristine surface with a hydrogen la layer on top of it that actually has that chemical charge uh, or electrical charge, if you will, that, that works in the, in the, uh, for the hydrophilicity. And that is what soaks up the, the, the liquid, whatever the liquid is. Uh, but in most of our cases, it is, it's, it's actually blood. And for that reason, one small recommendation, not just with this Thai Ultra surface, but in general, do not use any irrigation while placing the implant in the osteotomy. Uh, but leave the blood and the, uh, the, 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 all of the debris of bone, but they're full of uh, bone morphogenic proteins, and they will work well with implant surface to actually even enhance the osteointegration process. Uh, looking at comparison of this surface with uh, a selective surface, you will see that uh, anodized surface have pretty much unique uh, features and it will demonstrate the higher thrombogenicity. So basically what you're going to have is a better, atta well, attachment, ad adherence or better um, fixation of the coagulum to the Thai Ultra surface compared to the SL active. And then by having that, you're basically gonna have the uh, improved or faster OS integration. A lot of these are actually uh, in the, uh, this, this uh, uh, supplement of the, <coughs> excuse me, clinical implant dentistry and uh, related research. If you wanna scan the barcode on the, or QR code on the side, you can actually get the whole, uh, the whole issue for free. It is free and it is uh, available. Uh, and there's a lot of good articles actually there that explains the MUCO integration and uh, also integration with Thai Ultra. And here you see in this uh, case by uh, uh, Tristan Stas how it actually works when you place this implant, how the uh, implant pretty much soaks up the blood and how the hydro Felicity is on these implants. Tristan has his own technique of, uh, I tried it a couple of times of grafting and then uh, placing the implant within the graft actually uh, in the extraction socket, but let's not get into details of that. Let's try now to catch through the uh, immediate tooth replacement, the science are the limitation. Why, when, and how? Why, well, the patients are pretty much more and more demanding something like this when they come, you extract the tooth, what is it going to be the solution? You can have partial denture, which is the only good thing about it is going to take out a couple more teeth. So you're going to have more teeth to restore. And that's about it. The actually only good thing about partial denture, it's cheap. The three unit bridge, it is a good solution, fixed solution, but then you have to grind very often uh, healthy teeth and then uh, have the bridge placed in there. Uh, the implant immediately placed or delayed is most likely the best uh, biological solution. And then if you can do the immediate placement and do possibly the immediate loading, this is something that most of the patient will actually look for. 
And uh, yeah, let's keep through these. Let's go for the lack of time. Let's go to the biological uh, factors and principles that we're looking in this case. And now we have to understand the dynamic of the extraction socket and what happens when we take out the tooth. We have this number of uh, uh, animal studies that are done by, by uh, Linda and Narujo. We're gonna try to understand what's going on through them. Uh, but from all of them and from our daily practice, we know when we take our tooth, it's good, some bone is going to resorb. Let's try to understand how much. The socket will heal, that's for sure. But uh, during this time, there will be bone remodeling and it will happen quite fast. It will happen that uh, we, will, uh, we know from, as I mentioned from these studies, most of the resorption happens from the point of buccal wall. So there will be changes horizontally and vertically. Unfortunately, most of them happen uh, well, actually, I would sh shouldn't say unfortunately. Uh, it's even better when they happen horizontally than vertically because this is easier to restore. But vertical change is about 11 to 22 percent within the period of six months. Horizontal change is even up to 63 percent within the period of uh, six months. So. If you will look at the patients, we see exactly the same thing. Vertical dimensional change and horizontal dimensional change. And we can even show that with the uh, radiographs. And we see only eight weeks uh, after the extraction, uh, how the, our, our, our socket looks like and what are the dimensional changes within 3D analysis. Uh, study by Kim shows also how thin this, usually how thin this buccal wall is. It's a fraction of a millimeter in most of the cases. And then it's not strange that we are going to have these dimensional changes. And we also quite often look at the patients and I'll show that later on, we look now at the uh, extraction socket profile, the more prominent the buccal bone is, we know, we understand, that there is going to be more resorption in these cases. Uh, studies from uh, Arujo and Linde and uh, all of the other ones, we did actually here at the University of Belgrade, one of the first clinical studies looking at the uh, extraction socket that was 98 and understanding what's gonna happen. Uh, all of the, our studies show that we have labial bone resorption, socket bone will regenerate it comes from the more, most apical portion and goes up. Uh, something that we uh, periodontists really like is bundle bone, but uh, that will this, the, this, the resorb as well. Uh, it's not cortical bone, so for that reason, that goes in through the, through the, the, the resorption process as well. And then we understand nowadays that socket preservation is a key. You have to uh, augment in order to keep the volume of the socket. Now, one wonders if you would place the implant or actually uh, you know that with all of this, you will have to augment uh, prior to implant placement or sometimes together with implant placement, we'll see what, uh, in what case what. And this is one of these cases where actually these are more difficult to augment because you see that uh, implant placed here is more prominent from the, uh, from the bony housing. And uh, here you need a lot of augmentation, you need a good blood supply, you need the good technique of uh, fixing the bone, fixing the membrane, actually not allowing it to move. While Compared to the other one, this one is much, much easier to augment because you have bony surrounding, you have the bony housing, you have a good blood supply and it's easier to restore cases like this. So let's look at one of the cases where we actually have a situation where we have delayed placement, there was a bone resorption as it is described through the literature. So we go ahead, place the, prepare the implant site, you see how thin 
uh, this area is. If you want to place the implant in the right position, you're going to end up with a really, really uh, paper thin bone. Here we augment the site. Uh, the membrane was secured with sutures and six months later, this is the result that we have. We have, we gain about a millimeter and a half of the bone and now we can go, this is before and this is after the augmentation. Compared to this extraction socket, socket augmentation case from uh, a colleague of uh, mine from Croatia, a good friend, Dr. Daman Jelosic, uh, and uh, is a very nice case that I borrowed from him. You see in this case, uh, a, uh, these two teeth are extracted. Uh, and to be honest with you, I don't have many of these cases because in these situations, most of the times I would place the implant. However, this is good approach as well. If you're not placing the implant in these situations, augment, wait, and then place the implants and you have a uh, good solution afterwards. Now, why not if you are taking the tooth out why not place the implant and then think if you uh, are placing the implant in the socket the uh, uh, also another thing is you need a little bit less bone to regenerate because you obliterate a part of the socket with an implant yes you are decreasing a blood supply but then let's see what is important there if you are placing the implant in the extraction socket uh, what is going to happen with this gap, with this uh, still call it extraction site? Uh, this article from Botticelli, it is the uh, 16 years old article, but it's a classical article to see what happens. You place the implant and then marginal gap, meaning the gap between the implant and the uh, extraction socket, it will heal. It comes from the uh, socket bone regeneration, like when you extract the tooth. Mm -hmm. But you will lose about 56% of the ridge width. So which means, it means you can see that on the right, right uh, image, that the dimensional of the, uh, the dimensional, uh, dimension of the ridge has changed over time. Uh, and then, the conclusion from this and all of these other studies is the grafting will decrease the dimensional change. Uh, so the summary of the research, up to 50% of horizontal and a little bit less of the vertical volume will decrease. You, we will have about two millimeter of the apical decrease in the eight weeks. Most resorption actually happens in the first uh, month. So talking about uh, delayed placement will not actually do anything from the point of bone resorption. Implant by itself does not stop resorption. Ridge preservation two technique associated with mucogingival surgery, and this is something that is uh, what we understand nowadays, mucogingival surgery helps a lot with a more predictable result. This will minimize buccal uh, crest resorption. Is this evidence-based? Let's look at what we know from the studies. 2007, meta-analysis was impossible due to lack of evidence-based data. 2010, the first Cochrane review with seven randomized studies, and Cochrane review is sort of considered as the top of the science. When you can do Cochrane review, this is when you can prove things. The uh, 2012 analysis of the 46 clinical studies showed 98% uh, success rate uh, in two years, uh, two years uh, success rate with immediate implants. 2015 meta-analysis of uh, 73 studies revealed that 4% uh, implant loss compared to 3% to in delay. Now we're getting into saying this is as good as uh, delayed placement. And there is actually, uh, if you look at this 2012 study, this is the statement from the uh, European Association for Mose Integration. First outer is Klaus Lang, which was the biggest opponent of immediate implant placement. But when something works, even Klaus Lang has to admit that it works. 
And then we have more and more studies. We have more publications showing that this actually, sorry, let me just do this and I apologize. Uh, sometimes I have to see some of the slides as well, all the way. Um, 62 systematic reviews and we have uh, many, many uh, publications on PubMed. Now we see that this, this slide that I showed before, as we go on, not just that we have surfaces changed, we also have implant designs changed and uh, data that show that this, this really works. Let's look at the comparison in this study from the immediate and delayed implant placement. And what we're gonna focus on is the most critical part, which is the most coronal part of the bone towards the, on the buccal aspect of the bone. And try to understand, is the immediate placement as good as the delayed placement? Uh, this study uh, by, by Reese and actually uh, Cousin is the head, uh, the head of department uh, in Belgium that, that runs many, many good uh, studies and many good publications. So their group looked at these immediate and delayed implants that are placed about eight years before. They tried with, uh, to look at the CBCTs from these patients and try to understand what is, the, what is happening over time with the buccal bone. And the buccal bone was less than two millimeters at all implant sites, no matter how good you are, less than two millimeters, was less than one millimeters in 42% of the implant sites. But now what is interesting, looking at immediate and delayed, and this is the immediate, the, and the uh, upper table is the immediate implant placement, and on the lower table is the delayed. And you can see that in immediate, there is way more, or if you will, on a delayed, uh, out of eight patients, uh, actually eight patients had no buccal bone. And in an immediate implant placement, six patients were in the category of one to 1 1.5 millimeters of buccal bone. So what this tells us actually is that uh, there, in both, both, both groups, there were substantial dimensional changes and they are expecting at the buccal aspect of implants, uh, single implants plates in premaxilla. Pre as a result, contour augmentation procedures at the time of the implant placement should be considered. So they understood that we immediate implants, way they placement, place them were, they place the implant and they graft the buccal uh, aspect. So they, what their suggestion is, even with delayed implants, even if you have a good uh, amount of bone and they went by the boozer's criteria, meaning at least millimeter and a half of the buccal bone uh, being left over when the implant is placed. Even when you do everything by the book, you maybe should consider uh, contour grafting, meaning grafting, additionally grafting the buccal bone. This is what you're doing when you're placing immediate implants. You always should, as the research showed us, you should graft the, uh, the, the, the gap of the implant. So this is pretty much what you would see also from this study. So immediately placed implant and delayed placement implant. Maybe you don't have a millimeter and a half, maybe a millimeter here, but just to understand also the placement and the position of the implant uh, and uh, what you have there. Now, this study from uh, Tarnow and co authors look at four modalities just to prove what is good type of uh, treatment. Uh, they place the implant and play uh, four types of immediate placements, meaning if they immediately place the implant uh, with only healing abutment, uh, immediately placed with uh, temporary crown, immediately placed graft and uh, abutment, uh, healing abutment, and then immediate placement with graft and uh, augmentation. And as you can see from this table, 
bone grafting together with implant placement. Uh, so bone grafting the gap together with implant placement uh, gave the best result. It doesn't necessarily matter if it's healing abutment or provisional restoration, but you can see the dimensional changes uh, of the, the, from the buccal aspect that we have. Much better result when we graft compared to no grafting. So minimal dimensional changes of 0 0.1 uh, to 0 0.34 millimeters when bone graft is placed compared to 1.1, 1.2 millimeters when no graft is placed. Ridge preservation, technique that we described that we would use in a certain, uh, certain situations, and I will show you which one. And we see what are the alternations uh, when we do uh, rich uh, preservation, so-called socket seal. We have way less dimensional changes uh, when compared only to extraction. And then also depending on the material, we want to have more stable material, volume preserving material, slow or even non-resorbing if you will type of a xenograft that will be stable over time that will not allow for the uh, resorption because if we use resorbable, quite resorbable material like allograft, there will be certain dimensional changes there, there as well. And here's the papers that actually uh, prove that. Looking at the uh, reach preservation and immediate implants, uh, if we use only a autogenous bone, we will have 25% of the volume change compared to the low, slow resorbable or even if you will again non-resorbable materials like uh, most of the, the uh, most of the, the uh, xenographs are this will keep the volume so this is the choice of the material that we want to use in these kind of situation <coughs> and as we mentioned the survival rate of immediate implants is equal to those of delayed early or early place implants. But however, the aesthetic outcome may be better as you can see uh, from this publication from uh, Den Hortog. Uh, immediate placement, we could say lower cost, that depends of the pricing structure in, in, in whatever it is in your practices. Uh, but definitely less surgical invent interventions. By having less surgical interventions, it is less inv uh, invasive and there's less treatment time needed uh, for until the final outcome. So just a quote from Einstein. Uh, why would you have more problems when you can prevent them using these kind of techniques? The 3D, now let's go into position of an implant, and this is really the key to success. Uh, immediate implant placement does not necessarily mean placing an extraction socket. No, not at all. You do not follow the extraction socket. Uh, you want your implant to be placed away from the buccal bone into a good quality bone that most of the time you find uh, on the more oral aspects of the, whether that's maxilla or, or mandible. So here we have uh, a situation where an implant is actually failed implant extracted, one year, three year follow up. And you see, I'm sorry, uh, failed tooth is extracted and then uh, you see the follow up. And you see from this uh, CBCT image that the implant is actually not placed in directly in the apex of the extraction socket, we always try to aim for the more palatal position of the implant. Here you have another case, another planning. We do not follow the extraction socket, but go away from it, go more palatal. Here the tooth is extracted. Uh, the socket is debrided, well cleaned, implant being placed. And here you see again, one week post-operative, five weeks post-operative, and we're gonna follow it over time. This is before, this is one year later, and then uh, final result. And here, another case, pre-op, CBCT 
of the implant and one year post-op. As I mentioned to you before, sometimes we got lucky. In 2003, we used too wide of an implant. 2013, we do have a good result. Uh, however, if you look at this case, all of the parameters here are good. Good soft tissue, good quality bone, but as I mentioned, we didn't. So what we learned from all of this? Let's go run through this case again that was successful. This is implant, uh, the tooth being extracted. We used the crown uh, of the uh, uh, failed tooth. We're gonna use it to use it as a bonded restoration. Here we have good soft tissue, good quality bone, high crystal bone, implant being placed, grafted the gap. We used the uh, connective tissue graft to uh, seal the socket in this case and improve a little bit of the gingival biotype. And we see the use of the crown for as a bonded provisional. Then we go for the final restoration, the uncovering of the implant. And here you can see how big of an implant this is. However, the final restoration on the cementation there, here's the x-ray and we have uh, initial final seven years and there you have the 10 years follow-up and the x-ray that shows a fairly decent result. Flat to flat connection, we expected a little bit of bone loss. Now, going to the biological factors, what are the, good, the things that are going to predict our result and guide our treatment? Initial gingival position, you saw in the previous case, it was good high gingival margin. I want it as high as possible. And then uh, gingival biotype, we'll focus a little bit on that. And also crest, crest position and shape. Let's go into gingival biotype. Uh, we distinguish between thin and thick. Thin is less predictable. Actually, we know if we have thin gingival biotype, we would rather do something in order to uh, improve it when we have a thick, flat gingiva, like it is on the image to, on your right. Uh, we know this is a more favorable situation. So thin is uh, sort of uh, less pink, it is flat, it is scalloped. It, and when I say flat, no, I mean uh, in the part of the gingiva, it is uh, kind of shiny, not uh, like orange peel, what you see on the thick gingival biotype. A long uh, uh, kind of chiseled teeth, this is all what you can see in a thin gingival uh, biotype. And the research tells us mean recession with uh, is usually 1.1, but it's more with a thin gingival the biotype compared to the thick gingival biotype. And it's uh, uh, less than 0 0.5 millimeters with thick, more than 1.5 with uh, thin. And we also know when it's a thin gingiva, there's thin bone behind below it. More uh, bone loss will be with thin gingival biotype compared to with thick gingival biotype. And all of the latest research really looks at what happens with uh, peri-implant mucosa. The study from Linkovicius shows that we have significantly less bone loss when uh, we have thick uh, mucosal tissues compared to the thin mucosal tissues. Can we do something about it? Yes, of course, from the periodontal procedures, we know how to do soft tissue grafting and this can improve our gingival biotype. And this is the case that was done uh, about 11 years ago. This patient showed to our office with these really poor restorations. She told us I look like a, like a rabbit. I looked at her and said, you know, you more look like beaver because rabbits had teeth going down. You, these are going uh, up, but uh, yeah, well, let's see. She almost started crying to my comment. And let's say, okay, let's try to do something. Obviously these teeth are hopeless. Uh, then we placed here two speedy implants, uh, did the, yeah, our, the whole nine yards bucket uh, gap uh, augmentation and the soft tissue. Uh, augmentation to change her biotype from thin to thick. And this is 
her coming back one year after the treatment, because these are too immediately loaded, uh, she disappears for a year and then with very, very bad oral hygiene comes back, but we already have the situation improved. This is what it looks like at the impression taking, and this is the final result. Uh, actually, this is one year after she comes Again, not ideal hygiene use. We see a little bit of bleeding, but at least it's good. Then she disappears for another 10 years, and this is 11 years follow-up. She came in about a month ago, a month and a half, and this is what it looks like 11 years later. We have fairly stable result. Now, we have some recession on the uh, left central incisor compared to the right, but it looks even actually good. I may even suggest gingivectomy on the uh, right central incisor. And looking at the x-ray, this is what it looks like 11 years later. Good stable bone and everything that we expected from the flat to flat connection. Now we look at just the x-rays and you see on the right image that we have bone remodeling up to about a first thread. <coughs> Luckily, we improved uh, her gingival biotype and this is the reason why we have such a good result 11 years later that we have uh, pretty much no or minimal uh, recession or remodeling of the bone and a soft tissue, but still stable result 11 years later. You see now clinically what it looks like uh, after the, the, the restorations were made and then 11 years later. Uh, this is not going to definitely not going to move anywhere. And if anything, as I mentioned before, I would do something on the right central and leave the left uh, central as it is. Now, this uh, similar story with the girl that came in, and as I said, she's going to lose uh, left central and right lateral. And uh, here you see an unfavorable situation, thin gingival biotype, scalloped, uh, high scalloping, chisel teeth, and her situation, again, immediate implant placement, augmentation of a buckle, buckle gap, and again, grafting. Grafting with a soft tissue, improving gingival biotype, this is pretty much a standard that we have in our practice now when we treat these cases. This is her uh, one year after uh, the restorations uh, were placed. This is at the two years follow-up and we see stable uh, bone around the implants and we see stable soft tissues. Not just that she has stable situation in her mouth, she found a rich husband and now she has stable situation in her private life, saying that her, price is smile, that her smile is priceless, which is not true, we charged. And now, when we, as we follow then this, we develop, we moved from one type of a connection to another type of a connection. We understood there's something about conical connection that is very important and that we want to use uh, for our clinical benefits, which are the seal connection, which is the increased mechanical stand, uh, strength and the design the connection that is designed to enhance the soft tissue integration. So we look at a couple of examples when we see that how this platform shifting works for us to implants. These are immediate uh, restorations that were placed there and the here at the time of the uh, impression taking, you see how nicely soft tissues are shaped and we go for the final restorations with the individualized abutments in the Procera crowns. And this is at the placement, one year follow up and three year follow up. And you see that there's definitely different bone remodeling in these cases. We don't see bone loss or bone remodeling as we saw with flat to flat connections, whether that's internal or external connection. We see that we have bone remodeling to the level of the implant and not any more than that. And we see that constantly case by case and case by case that we are able with this type of a connection to preserve the bone uh, over the long period of time. Now be aware that you have conical connection and you have internal connection. They're totally different. 
completely different. You want to work with conical connection because of the seal that you have there and you're not minimizing a micro gap. When you have internal connection that has actually paralleled uh, walls of the uh, connection and the abutment, you will still have a micro gap and you will still see over time a micro leakage and you will not see these uh, kinds of bone preservation like you see with the conical connection. You see on the, some of these, for, uh, so the case from here, you see an implant placed and then second implant placed about six months later after this tooth failed and then you have the uh, delivery of the restorations and then you have the follow-up after uh, five years. And uh, here in this case, you have another case, seven years, seven years follow-up and six year follow-up of the previous case. So you see that it's, we see that constantly, it's not one case that you show, but we see over the long period of time and long follow-up that we have the same situation. The importance of the osseous crest, and uh, we see that when we try to figure out how we're gonna approach the extraction site, uh, osseous crest in most of the cases is what guides us if we're going to place the implant immediately or not, the, uh, the, the, the height of the osseous crest. And there we distinguish between three types of uh, extraction socket, type one, type two, and type three. Type one is what is ideal for an implant placement and immediate loading if we get all of the parameters there. So we have adequate bone, we have ap uh, enough apical bone uh, for destabilization of the implant. We have good osseous crest, buccally and interproximally, labial uh, buccal plate setting. Type two is characterized by uh, good soft tissues, but we have a uh, significant loss of a buccal bone. So uh, it's a sort of a moderate defect, extends through the middle third of the root. Uh, and there it is questionable if you, how you're gonna approach that. And then type three is when we have the loss of the hard tissues and the soft tissues, uh, and then inadequate bone for the placement and stabilization of the implant. So recession is also present. And then we, when we look at these three types of bone, the type one is what is predictable for the immediate implant placement and immediate loading. Uh, and then type two and three, not so much. So type three, uh, let's see how we would approach it. Most of the cases, as I said, we have quite a bit of uh, soft tissue loss. So what was the first thing we're going to try to repair there is actually soft tissue in order to be, have enough of a soft tissue to work with for the bone augmentation. We did a combination of uh, connective and epithelial graft here, and this is what it looks like when it's healed. Now we can approach this in different ways, whether that's gonna be placement of the implant and grafting at the same time, or we're going to stage it. In this case, it is. Uh, we have good bony housing after the implant placement, so the implant is placed and bony drafting, and then we're gonna go and restore it later. This type of a defect, even though it looks like type two more or less, but the moment this is extracted, this becomes a type three. So we stage this, we go and graft this. Uh, in this case, we had a good soft tissue to uh, be able to go for the primary closure. This is really old case. Uh, this is from the days when I was still a, a young student. Uh, so the bone is uh, grafted. Here we have, after the healing process, we have uh, enough bone for the implant placement. The implant is placed, soft tissue is grafted with a connected tissue graft at the time of the implant placement. And then we have a healing period. And then here is the final restoration. Uh, same type of approach here. We have a uh, type type three implant uh, extraction, a grafting procedure, implant placement, and the final restoration. And you see here how much of a buccal bone is missing. This is 
kind of type two. Yeah, there is sometimes it is difficult to say which one is type two, type three, because you definitely have a bone loss. Soft tissue is uh, starting with the recession, but in this case, it's okay. Uh, in this case, we go uh, in a lot of these cases, we go for the implant placement and you see how much of a bone housing we have here. A noble active here, uh, implant is here being placed. We're going to graft this site, non resorbable uh, or the slow resorbable xenograft is, is, is used, and resorbable collagen membrane. Always, always membrane is fixed, either with pins or with sutures. But same like a broken bones, when you have a broken arm, they fix it in order to heal. Same here, you want to fix your bone in order for that to heal and becomes bone. Uh, and this is how we treat these cases. Now we go for, this is our basic recipe book. If we have a situation, type one extraction socket, this is what we follow. And these are our criteria for immediate placement. And then you will see immediate restoration. Infection-free site or minimal infection that can be removed with carets intact. Yes, we go and uh, we don't necessarily treat people like this. This guy, if you have him in your practice, you would let him uh, take care of this acute infection. You uh, reduce infection by a use of antibiotics. And when it comes to chronic stage, then you can treat a case like this. Uh, intact buccal bone. Yes. High crestal interproximal bone. Yes. Enough bone to allow for this uh, sufficient primary stability. Yes, we go for the immediate implant placement. Did we uh, achieve required primary stability? 35 Newton centimeters. Yes, then we can go, and there's no excessive occlusal uh, forces, then we can go for the immediate uh, temporization as well. So this is basically our criteria. This is our recipe book. Uh, pretty much similar treatment concept published by Stephen Chu and Tarnow and their group sort of shows the same thing uh, for the same type of a treatment. So now let's see what do we do in our practice. Automatic tooth removal. Use your instruments to carefully remove the tooth as much as possible. You're going to use your, your blades your periotomes, your forceps, whatever you are using, but try to be as automatic as possible. No movements towards the buckle. These are all rotational movements with your forceps in order to uh, oh, not break the ball. And you see how this is done in the redneck country in the south of the, of the United States. Hey! Look, yeah. Totally automatic. Perfectly extracted to it. Dr. Vosilich, we're coming to the end of our session, so would you please conclude your speech? Okay. I'll just uh, go quickly through these uh, number of slides in order to show how we do these procedure that we follow. Uh, automatic extraction, uh, clean the site, you look at the breeze, whatever is there, you try to take it out, and then go into the, the palatal bone, try to find as much good as bone as possible in order to place your implant in the right position. Uh, do not go into the apex as I showed you before, this is ideal, a little bit towards the palate, and then here you see, this is where the root tip is. See the ideal osteotomy position where you start is not where you're gonna end up, it's going to be slightly buckle, and this is where you end up with your implants. If you place it more uh, too buckly, you're going to lose bone. Here's the implant placement. And uh, it is important what type of implant you use. The tapering implants give you more stability. These are the data that show that, that you're gonna be able to achieve much better stability with tapering implants. 
uh, I talked about prominent extraction socket. The more prominent it is, the more bone we're going to lose over time. When we have these prominent extraction sockets, we go ahead and uh, graft the buckle gap, but we also graft quite up the buckle aspect as well. And then we use the connective tissue grafts in order to be able to achieve a good result over time. And this is the, what we see uh, follow up of 10 months uh, using the uh, individualized uh, impressions as well. And at a one year, this is what we see. And with no uh, vertical incisions in the visible area, this is how we achieve good results. This is the five years follow up of that. Uh, so we, these are the, the rules uh, that we follow. Uh, let me see one thing, maybe just to show, uh, and this is from the restorative side. Uh, when we do these types of uh, uh, procedures and we do the immediate uh, types of restorations, make sure that uh, your crowns are as slim as possible. So under contour them, because if you over contour them, what well, they're gonna do over time, they're just gonna be pressing on a soft tissue. And if you do that, you will have the soft tissue recession, you're gonna lose the volume. So even if you have about a month after the placement, remove them, uh, try to remove under contour, try to reduce the volume. The soft tissues will follow that. And as you can see in this case, how it was at the time before the under contouring. And then uh, at the time when we wanted to uh, place the finals, we have much, much better soft tissue appearance. And uh, you saw this case before. We work with our uh, restorations towards our final uh, crowns. Also use these things like bone melts in order to re remove the uh, marginal bone in order to be able to, uh, to seed the crowns properly. We use some of these materials as soft tissues re replacement, the uh, uh, mucograph, the mucogain, the, all of these in the, we're trying to reduce the use of soft, uh, the connective tissue. It is promising, but I cannot say that they are the same as the soft tissue grafts. Uh, I just run quickly through this case uh, because here you will see, even with the best possible try to place your implants, sometimes your position of the implant is not ideal. And you, uh, you, uh, there are the studies that show that it doesn't matter how good your placement is, you have these situations where you cannot achieve uh, the position of the implant so that your screw channel is going to be on the palatal side of the implant. Uh, let's just run quickly through this. Uh, and basically what I want to show is the use of uh, things like uh, uh, angulated screw channel uh, abutments. You see the position of the implant, but then we're going to use the uh, ASC type of the abutment. We're going to change the angle of uh, our screw channel. We can do it by, by 25 degrees. And then uh, by doing that, you improve the clinical situation as it is shown in these studies. Use of ASC, you can, uh, in more cases, uh, go with the screw type restoration. You see how it is here. Uh, angulated screw channel abutment and then we go uh, for the final restoration and you see on this left uh, lateral incisor uh, that we use this type of uh, technology uh, change the position of the screw exoshell it's not on the incisal edge or buckle but it's going towards the palate and here's the final uh, restoration of this patient and we have the satisfactory restoration here. Uh, let's now just jump to basically our final final uh, just to go with the uh, what we talked about today. Extraction socket is very dynamic. Uh, we see the bone changes over a very short period of time but immediate implant placement is a predictable procedure when uh, when 
properly planned, when you look at all of the, re when you basically follow the research and certain, uh, certain uh, parameters are followed, then it is very, very predictable uh, procedure. Uh, the choice of surgical technique and the appropriate implant design is the key to success. Uh, I mentioned a little bit about the MUCO integration. This is the era that we're in. We look more and more into soft issues. We try to plan from that point of view as well uh, a lot when we are placing the implants. How are we going to develop stable soft issues over time? Uh, technology is helping us finally in that area as well. Uh, so the new uh, types of implants and new types of uh, abutments show uh, a good, good, good initial results. There's still time for that to be followed and for that to for us to understand it. With this, I thank you. Uh, open for questions. Keep calm. Stay safe in these these times. Thank you very much, Dr. Vasilich. Uh, thank you for all your nice uh, slides uh, with very rich documentation and uh, photographs. And also, I really give high credit for your nostalgic uh, slides at the beginning of your presentation. It really uh, made us feel uh, very happy to see how the technology assisted us throughout uh, the, the development of uh, oral implantology in this field and also to improve the lives of the patients as well. So thanks again for being with us here. And I would like to expect some questions from our uh, group. Our group consists mostly of PhD students. So please feel free to ask anything you would, uh, you would, you would like to. So one thing comes to my mind that probably you have received this question many times. What do you think about this popular or recently emerging partial extraction uh, or uh, the so-called socket shield technique in the immediate implantation, Dr. Russell? If I would have a penny for each time I receive the question, I would be a rich man. Uh, it is, I, I would, first of all, I would put it this way. I don't have personally enough clinical experience with that kind of a technique to make a, uh, a, a personal statement. What I see from the research currently is uh, it looks interesting, but the, the thing is you have, I mean, the, 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 the part of the tooth that is left in there present a foreign body. If you just think of your clinical practice, uh, and if you have a part of the, 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 the tooth that possibly can be exposed to the oral environment, most of the times it will end up as a sequester. And uh, I had good and bad experience with technique. I had a couple of cases where I had a uh, piece of the, that, that shield, if you will, uh, sequesting out. And that then ends up in a disaster. Uh, nothing that we do is 100% successful. However, I want to have things that are more predictable. And uh, I've been to uh, South Africa, attended the course from uh, one of the, 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 the most prominent people of uh, who is uh, suggesting or doing this technique, Javi Glukman, and I was lucky enough to talk to him, learn from him uh, about the technique. Uh, but as I said, I did number a few cases with the technique. Uh, I was mostly successful, but I don't have enough follow-up. And I, th I would say nobody does. Uh, and when I say follow, uh, enough follow-up, I want to see things five, ten years, how they work. Uh, the study will come from Loma Linda that is not necessarily showing that good of results. Joe Khan and his group are working on this as well. 
uh, I know the preliminary result there, they're not necessarily that great. Or let's put it this way, compared to the techniques that we are using currently, this has no advantage. Uh, she, a socket shield is also very technique sensitive. And I know in the cases that I did, I didn't do it very well because my uh, shield was, I didn't remove enough of the tooth. That stayed exposed to the oral environment. So you have to be extremely good trained, extremely well trained to use these kind of techniques. You need for the other things as well, but this is even more technique sensitive because you have to know how much of that uh, uh, buccal uh, root you will leave and how much you will actually remove in order not to allow it to be exposed to a oral environment because the moment it, it does, that's the, that it goes into a disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I also agree that it's a really very technical, demanding technique and uh, no one will be able to reproduce the same result in, in a very narrow area that you, we were speaking about millimeters or, or sub millimeters. Thank you for, for explaining Thank that. You. And maybe one last question or would you like to give us a hint uh, to our young colleagues about uh, of, uh, about something about uh, immediate implantation? What would they uh, look for, or what is what is some kind of trick that comes well, to your mind? If you are your your treatment, your diagnostics, uh, diagnosis, and treatment planning are the key. Uh, I mentioned a couple of things. When you look at a patient, your patient selection has to be, if you're starting, everything is about patient selection. You want to choose the patient and the situation that is more predictable. So in that case, what you want to see is uh, a patient with, uh, uh, you don't want to run into cases with infection, definitely. Uh, yes, I treat cases that have some uh, apical processes, but they have to be uh, in a chronic stage. They have to be cleansable. The uh, second thing is uh, you want to have a type one extraction socket that I showed there. So has to be high osseous crest, high interproximal bone. The next thing is make sure that your first cases are not with a thin gingival biotype. If you start with that, you're gonna get disappointed. Uh, if you are not skilled in connective tissue grafting, then take a, a, a learn to do that first and then go into treating the extraction sockets. Because if you know how to take a good and do execute a good connective tissue graft, then you're gonna be able to improve the soft tissue uh, thickness as well. And we know nowadays, it's not that we just learn. We know, I can clearly say that. We know the import, that soft tissues are extremely important. Without stable soft tissues, we're not going to get a good result. When I say good result, I don't mean today. And I don't mean uh, six months from now. I mean 10 years from now. And this is, I'm, I'm in private practice. I tend to be there 10 years from now as well. Unless you want to, uh, unless you're moving every five years from city to city or from country to country, you can do then whatever you want. But if you're planning to stay at one place more than 10 years, then make sure that things you do are the same, are predictable, and they are the successful 10 years from now. So that's what I'm saying. Case selection is the key. Understanding what gives you predictable result as well knowing the choice of the techniques and then you're going to be understanding what following certain guidelines in sense of how you're going to where you're going to place the implant uh what are you going to do with it and knowing i mean with i am i'm going to be 15 in in uh in 10 days see 11 from now. <laughs> thank you uh, <laughs> 
But uh, still today, uh, still, still to this day, I read about, uh, I go through about 50 articles every month. And this is my goal. I have to stay up to date with the uh, with, uh, literature. I have to stay up to date with evidence. I have to understand everything that is others that people are doing in order to understand maybe what's good, what's bad, and what's going to work in my hands. So, yeah, that's, if, that's again, completely. just going back, if I'm young, really start with a uh, case selection, the key, understanding, fully understanding the patient, not just where I'm going to place the implant. If you're a surgeon, you have to have good restorative knowledge. If you're a uh, prosthodontist, you have to know the surgical part as well because we're treating patients, we're not treating, uh, we're not screwing implants.